Thank you so much, Pastor. So good to be with you guys. Appreciate uh, all the co-op folks that helped promote this. Becky and Kim and Marissa, you guys kind of lead the charge, and others that kind of helped with that. And Pastor Jeff, Pastor Tim, we were just saying it was about a year ago. We were kind of banging our heads together and saying, hey, would this be of interest down here? And so here we are, able to talk a little bit with you young people, and I'm just excited to be here to visit a little bit about my favorite topic in all the world, and that is dinosaurs. And I brought some fun stuff with me. So these are all things over here that you can touch. Let's be really careful with some of the fossils because some of these are real fossils. Somebody tell me what is a fossil. Some young person out there, tell me what's a fossil. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right here. Very good. Dinosaur bones are fossils. But are the only things that are fossils bones? What else can be fossils? I've got something in my hands. And this is called coprolite. This is not a bone fossil. This is something else. Does anybody know what coprolite is? Yeah. No? Yes. Is it a, a walk? A rock. Well, it's been turned to rock, but what was it originally? Not a bone. Yes. I, I say it a little louder. Don't be embarrassed. I think you got it right. Dino poop. This is this is fossilized dino doo doo. Doesn't stink anymore. So a fossil is any relic or leftover biological material, even a footprint that has been preserved so that we can still see it today. Sometimes it's skin, that's pretty rare. Sometimes it's poop, sometimes it's a footprint, but mostly it's bones. Here's a real dinosaur knee bone. This would kind of sit right about here on a dinosaur. But you can come take a look at this stuff afterwards. I've got all kind of fun things. I've got a, a T-Rex tooth here. Whoa, look at that, about the size of a banana. And then of course some of my friends, I love these dinosaurs. Anybody know what kind of dinosaurs this kind of? Really, yeah. Very good, a Brachiosaurus. Way to go, guy. That's awesome. Brachiosaurus got that kind of tall neck that kind of stands up like that. So we're going to talk about some different things here. Steve, let's get some slides going along here. Uh, keep bouncing through these. We're going to talk this morning about four facts about fossils. Then we're going to have a little lunch break. We're going to come back. We're going to have a second session. We're going to talk about dragons. Ooh, that's going to be fun. And then tomorrow, tomorrow, some of you guys have churches that you're members of, and, and I think that's fine. You guys, uh, that you guys do what you got to do. You, got, you, you maybe need to support your local church. We don't want to drag you out of that. But if you, if you can come tomorrow for Sunday school, we're going to talk about the Ice Age. The Ice Age. And I'm going to have some woolly mammoth fossils. These are really special. Straight from Siberia. Some real woolly mammoth fossils. Uh, we're going to talk about the fiery flying serpent for our morning service. And then finally, Steve, our evening service, Answering Atheists. So we'll be talking about how do we respond to somebody that doesn't even believe in God. And we're going to give you some answers for that. Okay, let's jump into the four facts about fossils. Now, here's what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to say the fact. And then we're all going to repeat the fact. So let's jump a slide here. Uh, and we're going to, I'll say the first one. Fossils are the result of a catastrophe. Let's all say it. Fossils are the result of a catastrophe. Let's flip a slide. So what we have here uh, in this first slide in the upper left is this dinosaur. And this dinosaur is having a bad day, isn't he? This dinosaur is getting buried by something. What's he getting buried by, children? Somebody tell me. He's getting by, uh, buried by like a big flood, isn't it? But what's that flood carrying? Dirt, right? So it's real important, if you're going to get a fossil, that we have quick burial. And the most common way you're going to get quick burial is with like a flood, a tsunami that's carrying a lot of dirt and debris and material with it, and that can overwhelm things and bury them. Now it could be a landslide, it could be a volcanic ash, but most often it's a flood, and that's why we get those different layers, is the different pulses of water and the different speeds of water can carry different rocks and stuff. And so you see this dinosaur got buried. Now, listen, if he doesn't get, come on in guys, come on in. Don't be bashful. We've got some great seats in the front here. Karis, how you doing? And, uh, and we got some more over on the left there. we got lots of spots, so come on up front here. 
The best seats are up front. You can see the white of your eyes. So to make a fossil, the number one thing, quick burial. If you don't bury something right away, let's say a cat dies beside the road. Is he going to turn into a fossil? What's going to happen to him? He's going to either decompose, he's going to rot right there, kind of eventually just turn to dirt, or maybe, what else? Who's going to say, who's it eaten? Gold star for this young man right here. He's going to get gobbled maybe by a coyote or something like this, right? He's going to turn into, you know, dog food. So in order to get a fossil, we need to have quick burial before it can rot or get scavenged. And then number three, we need to have a little bit of time. We're going to talk about this more, but it doesn't have to be millions of years. We need to have a little bit of time, and we have to have some pressure to push that dirt, the minerals, into the bones. And so now these fossils are turned into rock. If you lift them up, you'll be able to say, whoa, that's heavier than a, bo a normal bone. And it's because the minerals have taken the place of the bone cells. And so now it's been mineralized or fossilized, see? And then number four, how do we find it? We have to have a little bit of erosion or somebody has to start digging there. And then it reveals maybe a little bit of bone and people go, oh, 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 look, there's a bone sticking out. And they come and they start digging, 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 digging. And then pretty soon they see all these bones and they get a skeleton of a dinosaur. So those are kind of our four steps. Uh, Steve, let's get the next slide there. Now, here's what's kind of cool. If you look at all the fossils that are out there, 95% of all our fossils are shellfish. They're clams, oysters, etc. So most of our fossils are shellfish. 95% of what's left is algae or plant fossils. So lots of clams, lots of plants. And the most common fossil animal is a fish. So the fossil record is best understood as a marine cataclysm. That's kind of a couple of fancy big words. It basically means the fossils that are out there are mostly ocean animals. That's almost all the fossils. There's some dinosaurs, there's some other animals out there, um, saber-toothed tigers and stuff, but uh, mammoths, mastodons, but the big bunch of it is fish. Now what's that telling you? What's that tell you about the fossils, the big picture of the fossil record? What's that telling you right there? Somebody tell me, put it in your own words. What does that mean that most of it is? Yes. Yeah, most of it is fish, yeah. Yeah, so what, what's, what, what, what brought most of these fossils onto the land? What, what was it? Yeah, water, a big flood, right? Had to bring all that onto the land. Because a landslide's not gonna get lots of clams and bring them up on the land, is it? Or a volcano, no, it takes a huge wave. And so it's a marine cataclysm, slide. Here are some pictures, and I got one here too. Now, why do you think that these are all fossilized closed. Why are none of them fossilized open? Yes. Okay, this is a really good guess. Maybe the pressure of the dirt would force them not to open up, but what if it's really quick, like boom, the wave just comes over and buries them the way they are? Yes. Okay, that's how they were when they were buried. What happens normally to a clam when it dies? Yes. No, good guess. It opens, because it's a big muscle, and it takes muscle power to keep it closed. And so when you cook them, like in hot water, anybody ever eat clams? They relax and open up, because it's just a big muscle is all it is, and you can put your little fork in and get them out, put them in some butter, go um, 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 and gobble them up. So what does this tell you that we find them all fossilized closed? Yes. Yeah, they were protecting, but they, here's the thing, they were fossilized alive. They died by fossilization. That's how fast this was going. They didn't have time to die and slowly relax and open up. They died very, very quickly. Slide. Now, 
not only do we see fast fossilization, but another thing that we see about the fossil record that helps us understand that it was a catastrophe is something called fossil graveyards. Fossil graveyards. What's a fossil graveyard? Can somebody tell me? Yeah. A whole bunch, exactly. Hey, you ever play with Tinker Toys or Legos? And maybe you got tired of it and you just said, oh, I'm going to make them in a big pile. You want to swoosh and make them a big pile at the end of the table. That's how we find fossils a lot of times. There will be like maybe no fossils and no fossils and no fossils. Then we find a whole bunch in a huge pile. That's called a fossil graveyard. Now, this is very, very common. It's so common that major museums show displays of fossil graveyards. It's lots of times how we find most of our great dinosaurs we go to one of these big fossil graveyards. Here is the Carnegie Museum. The Carnegie Museum is uh, uh, over on the other side of Pennsylvania, so it's the Pittsburgh side. Flick the slide. Here we see in the next slide the Harvard Museum. This is near Boston up my, my way. The next slide. And uh, here we see the American Museum of Natural History. Guys, I was there. Thursday and took this picture. Fossil graveyards. Everything you see there is bone. This is a display to show you. Now, what would cause this? What would cause all the animals to go and die in one place? You think when animals got ready to die, they said, hey, Jimmy, when you get close to dying, the cemetery's over there, 100 miles downstream. Let's all go over there to die. What? Animals don't think like that. They're going to die when they die, right? Slide. Look at this. This area had so many dinosaur bones in that one spot, they used them like bricks to build a cabin. And it's called the fossil cabin. Slide. I got to go uh, a couple summers ago to Dinosaur National Monument. Anybody been there out in Utah? OK, you've been there? There's a whole mountain of dinosaur bones, slide. And they've actually taken part of it and built a roof over it, and you can go right up and you can actually touch the dinosaur skeletons in there. Now, guys, why is this? Why would all the dinosaurs come to one place to die? How do we think this happened? Yes? Maybe a big wave. Ooh, a big wave could do it. High five. Yeah, a big wave could carry a lot of dinosaurs, slide. Maybe a big wave came along and swept millions of dinosaurs with it, carried them across the land, kind of like your hand would slide a bunch of Legos into a big pile. And then as the waves slow down, they all end up there and they get buried with mud. Slide. Now let me show you something else about it. You'll see this. If you go to museums, look for this. Not only do we see fossil graveyards, but we see something very strange about when dinosaurs die. It's called the dinosaur death pose. If you look, most dinosaur fossils, I'm not talking about like just bits and pieces, but when there's a whole skeleton, their head is back like that. All, all you young people try that. Stick your head way back, kink it back as far as, why would dinosaurs die that way? They don't walk around like that. This is called the dinosaur death pose slide. Look at this. This is from the American Museum of Natural History. We just took this picture. Look at how they show that neck kicked around the slide. Look at this as a T-Rex. Well, look at his neck. Is that the normal way a T-Rex will hold his head? No. Why is he doing that? Why is he kicking his head all the way around backwards? Slide. Look at this long neck dinosaur with his neck, his head's almost touching his backbone. Next slide. This is a pterodactyl. What's a pterodactyl? Is a pterodactyl a walking kind of dinosaur? Yeah. What does it do? Flying. Flying. But look at his head. Now, boys and girls, why do you think they died this way? What? OK, that's a good guess. Maybe the dinosaur killed it. Yes? I'm sorry, the what? OK, the impact of the wave, but then you get trying to turn back around and find the dirt would kind of lay on it. It's a good, that's a good try. Yes. They broke their neck. They may have broke their neck doing this. But when we die in water, we call it drowning. A normal reflex is to go 
and try to reach up as far as you can to get some air. That's a normal reflex when things are drowning in water. And so when we see this, we should think in terms of a catastrophe, a watery catastrophe. Slide. Now we know in the Bible that there was once a watery catastrophe. What do we call it? The Noah's flood, right? 2 Peter 3, 5 to 6 says this, By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. There was a time when our whole world was over flooded with water, and God killed that old world. And so, slide, our first fact was fossils are the result of a catastrophe. Now, second point. Ready for this? Fossils do not show evolution. Let's all say it. Fossils do not show evolution. Well, let's give you a story about dinosaur evolution. There was a little fishy once. He looked up and said, hey, there's a cute little island. I'm going to walk on it. And so the fishy climbed up over the island. And the fishy said, hmm, that was fun. I'm going to climb over it again. And the fishy says, you know what? I kind of like this idea of climbing and walking. So his legs kind of got a little bit longer. And pretty soon he's kind of dragging his belly, but he's climbing on the land. And then he started to get good at this. He started walking, and he said, you know what, I'm getting a little bit hungry. And so he started looking around for something to eat, and he was able to find something to eat. And he gobbled this little spider, and that gave him some strength so he could maybe run a little bit faster. And he was able to kind of get his belly up, and his legs grew a little bit longer. And then he began to chase bigger things to eat. And he began to find things like a lizard. But to catch a lizard, he had to run even faster. So then maybe he had to learn how to run on two legs, and then he could catch things that were faster, like a lizard. And that's how you got from a fishy into a dinosaur. What do you boys and girls think about that story? It's fake. Well, you just saw the pictures. They were kind of cartoons, weren't they? Boys and girls, there are people called evolutionists, evolutionists, and they believe instead of God making the dinosaurs and the fish and the lizards and the spiders, that one kind of animal slowly, little by little, over millions and millions of years, turned into another kind of animal. And that's how we got amazing things like dinosaurs. And that's a story they tell. And they tell this in public schools. Now, most of you guys are homeschooled. I understand that. But maybe someday you're going to go to college. And somebody's going to tell you a story like that. Somebody that's really smart. That you might respect, a professor. And we have to be careful to be kind and to be understanding and realize not everybody's been taught God's word, the truth of the Bible, but boys and girls understand that is just a story. That is all it is. And sometimes they'll say, well, we have fossils that show some of these things. Slide. The fossils show lots of variety. Lots of kinds of dogs, for example. We have little tiny doggies, and we have big doggies. How many have a dog for a pet? Oh, lots of you guys have dogs for pets. What, do you, what kind of dog do you have? Ooh, a mountain dog. He's pretty big, right? He, he'd probably be on the bigger dog. But you know what? They're all still dogs. Slide. There's big horses, and there's little horses. But they're all still horses. So God made animals and even people to have lots of variety. And we find different people's bones buried. Slide. And the, and the evolutionists tell stories about this. And they say, you see that guy over on the left? He's kind of an ape. And over millions and millions and millions of years, that ape became a human. Now, boys and girls, the same thing applies to these bones. Slide. Over on the left, all these are apes. Slide. Over on the right, all these are humans. Now, what about that one in the middle? Is that the missing link between apes and, apes and humans? Yes. It's an ape and a human. It's an ape and a human? No, 
no, we don't have apes and humans. God made kinds of animals and kinds of people. We have lots of varieties of people and lots of varieties. But kinds always stay the same through time. Yes? Maybe it's halfway through the evolution. So what this is, this is homo habilis. It's a bunch of little bits and pieces. They have maybe a bone like a tooth, maybe a little bit of a knee bone, and they have some tiny bits and pieces, and that's where all the evolution is supposed to happen. And even the evolutionists admit homo habilis is kind of like a garbage can where they throw miscellaneous bits and pieces that they don't understand what it is in homo habilis. No, we've got people and we've got apes, but we don't have any real ape men. Slide. So this idea of a kind is really important. And maybe you can kind of develop this if you're homeschooling a little bit. Uh, but you can count how many times in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 God uses the word kind. God makes each original kind of plant and animal and God made them to reproduce after their Kind. Now, boys and girls, all these on the tap are a kind called. So, some, some, young, some, some girl tell me. Some girl tell me. What, what are those kinds of animals on top? Some girl tell me. Over here. Cats. Some boy tell me. What kind are these kinds on the bottom? Some boy tell me. Yeah. Dogs. Now we have cats on the top, including a naked cat. That's actually a real cat. Can you believe that? A naked cat. And lions and tigers and cheetahs and pumas and wildcats and oh, ocelots. I mean, got all these different kinds of cats, jaguars. But they're all cats. Saber tooth. They're all cats. On the bottom, we got dingoes and foxes and coyotes and wolves and great danes and mountain dogs and little tiny poodles. Right? They're all dogs. We got dogs and cats. We don't have dats and cogs. <laughs> we don't have the in-betweens. Slide. So this idea of a kind is really important, and God stresses this and mentions it over and over again, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. Humans are a kind. We are all brothers and sisters. Oh, there's lots of variety. Some have light hair, some have dark hair. Some have lighter skin, some have darker skin. Some have, uh, some are really tall, some are kind of scrawny, some are really uh, short, maybe a little stockier. And here, you know, people get so worked up because of varieties. Oh, well, I, I'm dark-skinned, and you're light-skinned, you know, or, or I'm, I'm light-skinned, you're dark-skinned. Guys, it's a tiny little difference. We're all brothers. We're one kind. We're one blood. You know, somebody said, well, I'm white. Nobody is really white. This is white. Am I white? No. Nobody's completely white. Nobody's completely black. We're all various shades of brown. It's just a pigment called melanin. We're all brothers and sisters. And so we need to recognize that God made humans. We're all created in God's image with a purpose. God loves you. He has a purpose for your life. Slide. And this idea of kind is really important. So rather than showing millions and millions of years of evolution, what do the fossils show? The fossils actually show the earth is young. Slide. How old do you think dinosaur bones are? Think they're millions of years old? What do you think? Ooh, very good. Gold star for this young lady. Only thousands of years. Slide. Here we see in a particular rock formation in Montana called the Hell Creek Formation, they found a T-Rex bone. And they were taking this T-Rex bone out, and it snapped in half, and inside was still soft, gooey tissue. Gooey! Blood cells! Now there's no way this is going to last for even 100,000 years, much less millions of years. Unfossilized dinosaur bone is powerful testimony against this idea of dinosaurs living millions of years ago. Slide. Look at this. This is blood cells under microscope from inside dinosaur bones. Slide. Here you see soft, gooey tissue that's pliable like a rubber band still that was found inside a T-Rex bone. Boys and girls, don't believe these are millions of years. You go to a museum like I went to the American Museum of Natural History up in New York City, and it's going to tell you, this dinosaur lived 60 million years ago. That's somebody's speculation. 
That's a story somebody's telling. The dinosaur didn't come with a birthday sticker on him saying, I was born 25 million years ago. Oh, okay, okay, Sue, that's very nice. No, it didn't happen that way. They're making up stories. That's their interpretation. It's not a fact. It's a guess. Slide. Here's what's really cool. Just a couple of years ago, we discovered actual DNA, slide, in a hypercarosaurus fossil, and they recovered genetic material. Now, DNA is so fragile that if we have someone die, maybe in a crime scene, and we don't discover the body for a while, maybe even just for a few months, the DNA is so quickly deteriorates that we cannot do DNA fingerprinting on it to even ID the body. It can happen that fast. And yet, we have it in a hypercarosaurus fossil. What's that tell you about it? Is that fossil millions of years old, boys and girls? No, there'd be no DNA left. See that? It would all deteriorate. Slide. <coughs> Here we see dinosaur cells dividing and actual DNA in a dinosaur bone. That's a cool picture. Okay, next slide. Now, the floodwaters were on the Earth for about a year, and that provided enough time when pressure to turn plants and animals into fossils. Now, sometimes I go into schools and I talk to older students or I go into colleges and they said, really, Dino Dave, one year. You're going to turn dinosaur bones into fossils in one year. Really? Oh, yeah, these fossils can happen quickly. Slide. The animals could have gotten swept with big waves. Lots of sediments put on top of them, and then lots of pressure. Lots more than you would normally get today. Today, we almost never see fossils forming. But the flood would have been unique conditions that would have made almost all the fossils that we see out there. Slide. Here is a fossilized egg. What's in that egg, boys and girls? A baby dinosaur. He's at, he was going to hatch out of the egg, but he got turned into a fossil. The whole egg got turned into a fossil. And the article, the scientist, the, the, the paleontologist that dug this up, said this, quote, fossilization may have been the cause of death. Now, is that fast? Oh, my goodness, that's fast. Yeah, he actually dies being fossilized. That's because so much tissue and even eyeball was preserved that they said it had to happen really fast. Next slide. Look at this fish. You see that fish? Look at his eyeball and his teeth. This is a quote from Science News. The fossilization process was probably taking just a few hours, but no more than a few days. My friends, it's a year, plenty of time. How about fossil fuels? Don't we, don't we have to have millions of years to make things like coal and oil? We know that's buried way down there because we drill down, we pump up this oil. Doesn't that take millions of years, Dino Dave? No. Slide. Here's a quote. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you about these guys in the uh, a lab were able to turn algae into oil in hours. Slide. Look at this. Engineers working at the U.S. Department of Energy at the Pacific Northwest National Lab reported they were able to transform harvested marine algae into crude oil in less than one hour. Does it take a lot of time? No. What does it take? It takes the right environment, heat, pressure. That's what you would have had during the Genesis flood. Now, the Bible says the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. That was not going up, not going down, just pushing down and making all those plants and animals into what? Fossils or fossil fuels, right? Like oil, and coal, natural gas. So that's when all this happened. The Bible fits it perfectly. Six months of lots of pressure. There would have been some as the water was coming up and some as it was going down, but mostly during this time where it was just staying there and pushing down, we would have had a lot of these fossils formed. Okay, so we talked about fact number one, which is fossils are the result of a catastrophe. We talked about fact number two, fossils don't show evolution. They rather show uh, that things happen quickly. Fact number three is fossils reveal a past world. Let's all say it. Fossils reveal a past world.
Hmm. There was a world before the one we have today. What was it like? The Bible says it was good. Over and over and over again, God says it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. Are there some things that we have in our world today that aren't so good? Like what? Uh, robbers. robbers, yeah, those, those definitely aren't so good. <laughs> they, they are out there. What, what else? Anybody been sick yet? Do we have any colds? I hear somebody sneezing. Yes. People dying. Oh, that's a really good point. That's worse even than being sick, isn't it? People dying. Is that the way God originally made it? See, God made this world to be good. And we can't even, I think, completely understand how the original creation was. It was very different. People got to a certain age and would just stop. You wouldn't get any older. And people, nobody would die. And, and, and you never get hurt. I was playing basketball just a week ago. And with a bunch of guys that are much younger than me, and I probably shouldn't have even been trying, but there was a guy in front of me, and I jumped up kind of backwards a little bit so I could get a shot off, and I landed on this foot, and I twisted around, and the whole foot went, and I kind of fell over backwards, and I sprained my ankle, and Dino Dave's been hobbling around, and I'm like, ugh, that's bad. Maybe some of you guys can think of some bad things that have happened to you. Is that the way God meant for the world to be? No. no. God meant it for all of it to be good. Slide. So we see some evidence of this in the fossils. The things in the past were bigger, healthier, lived longer than even the varieties that we see today. Let me give you some examples in this slide. Here is a centipede. That's eight feet long. Ooh, that is a long bug, isn't it? Some of you ladies are saying, bah! is that really a good world? I'm not so sure. Uh, it's all right, it's all right. You know, he's friendly. Eight foot, can you imagine that? Eight foot slide. Look at this. This is a rhinoceros. We actually saw a fossil of this at the American Museum of Natural History. It is a hornless rhinoceros called the Paracatherium, weighed about 24 tons, would be the largest mammal to walk the earth. Much bigger than the modern white rhino. Slide. Look at this. Grasshoppers have been found two feet long. That's as big as a cat. Can you imagine trying to catch a grasshopper that's as big as a cat? How high could that jump? Probably really high, right? Slide. A two, in 2008, a one-ton rat was discovered in Uruguay. A one-ton rat. Does anybody have a rat trap that could catch a one-ton rat? You have one? <laughs> You're going to catch it. A gun. An elephant gun, maybe, right? That's as big as a car. Slide. Look at this. An eight-foot-long monster millipede discovered in New Mexico, fossilized in 2005. Slide. Deer. I saw this also at the American Museum of Natural History. If you guys ever want a good field trip, that is a really good field trip. You've got to put things in perspective a little bit. There's some great fossils. But can you imagine an 11-foot rack? Are there any hunters in here? Any of you guys hunt? A couple of you guys, or ladies. I shouldn't, you know, be gender stereotyping here. Uh, anybody can hunt, right? But if you hunt, you might be tempted to catch a deer and then put the rack up on the wall, mount it. Would you really have a room big enough to mount an 11-foot rack? Maybe not. Slide. Look at this. This is from the Yale Peabody Museum. A turtle 15 feet wide would have weighed three tons. You boys and girls could sit on the back of this thing and just kind of ride around the ocean, right? It's a sea turtle, a swimming turtle. It's like the movie Nemo, man. Like, can you imagine this thing? Archelon, slide. Here is a megalodon, an ancient fossil shark. 60 feet long, twice the size of our great white shark. All these things were bigger in the past. Slide. Mr. Steve, slide please. Look at this dragonfly with a three foot wingspan. That's as big as my dog. Poor little DNA, he's scared, right? Slide. You ever heard of Big Bird? This is Big Bird. 13 foot tall bird. That is big bird. Slide. Fleas, one inch long, discovered in China. That is a big flea. Slide. 
armadillos. We have armadillos now, and they're these little things that kind of scurry along. But there is this glyptodont, which was an armadillo weighing two tons. Slide. Big birds, we have a bald eagle up there. That's a pretty big bird. But we have birds in the fossil record with a 25-foot wingspan. Much bigger than the bald, the, the bald eagle. OK, slide. The Bible says people were big, too. Genesis 6 forces, there were giants in the earth in those days. Slide. How big? I don't know how big. The biggest guy, Guinness World Record, the biggest guy on record was 8 foot 11. There you see me standing next to a statue of him. He wore a 37 AA shoe. That's a, that's a pretty big shoe, right? That's, that's a big foot. He's a big foot right there. But that's crazy big. But, I mean, we don't know. They maybe were a lot bigger in the, in the early earth. Everything was healthier, lived longer, was bigger. Slide. And so we have things like behemoth bunnies and monster millipedes and giant guinea pigs and huge hedgehogs and slide. They want you to think primitive is smaller. No, primeval is larger. Everything was bigger on the early earth. Slide. So fossils reveal a past world. And then our last fact, fossils remind us about judgment. Let's all say it. Fossils remind us about judgment. What happened to that early world? It died, yes. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. What was the sin that caused God to judge his original good creation? Yes. That's right. Adam and Eve ate from the tree that they weren't supposed to, right? Slide. God had made a beautiful garden called what? Garden of Eden. Not the Garden of Eating, but the Garden of Eden. And it was all beautiful and perfect. Slide. But then Adam and Eve did what God said not to do. They listened to satanic lies about God in the form of a serpent and they took this fruit don't know what fruit it was but they ate it took a bite out of it both of them ate it and all of a sudden they disobeyed God and God had to judge slide and God had to send them out of the garden and all of a sudden you see thorns growing and darkness and God had to clothe them with with, with skins of animals some animals died and there's these two cherubim that are guarding the garden so that people can't go back in there again. And you'd think people would learn their lesson. Sin is terrible. Disobeying God brings horrible consequences in God's judgment. But look what the Bible says it was like afterwards. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It got worse after that. People began to just sin all the time, constantly sinning. People were violent, hurting other people and killing people. And so God decided to send one huge judgment to wash the whole world away. What was that? Jesus, yeah, that would come eventually. But what was God's judgment on the early world? The Noah's flood, right? Slide. And so God sent the waters of the flood and God washed away all that wicked world. And God made with the flood, God made lots of fossils. And so when we think about these fossils, this is an actual real megalodon tooth fossil here, that giant shark I was talking about. But these fossils should remind us about God's judgment on his good world. God had to judge people's sin. God is holy, and God will judge sin, boys and girls. And so we see in Genesis 7, 22, all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, and every man. There's only one family that survived. What family was that? Yes. Noah. Noah's family, right? But everybody else died. Slide. And so we see down in the lower layers of the fossil record some human artifacts. These are kind of interesting. These are artifacts that evolutionists would say are not supposed to be there. Slide. And I have a replica with me this morning of something called 
the London artifact. Now this was found in Texas in the same exact rock layer that has dinosaur bones and dinosaur footprints also down there. And that same rock layer, they discovered a little tool. What does that look like to you? What kind of tool is that? A hammer. A hammer found in dinosaur layers. What does that mean? Boys and girls, does that mean there was a hammersaurus that was running around that was making hammers? <laughs> probably? No, probably not. What does this mean that a hammer is found in the same layer? Yes. Oh, it was a guy looking for bones. Well, this is a good guess. Yes. Oh, yeah, maybe it's what Noah used to build the boat. This comes from the time before the flood. I don't think it was Noah's hammer because he probably would have had a little workshop on the ark, maybe do some repairs or use after the flood, I'm guessing. So probably it wasn't his hammer, but it probably was somebody's hammer. Yes. Yeah, probably this was somebody's hammer, and that guy missed the boat. <clears throat> Slide. I'll leave this up here. You can take a look at it. This is a, rep as a re reproduction of it. In 1944, a young man, 12 years old, named Newton Anderson, his job was to go down the basement and get a bunch of coal and put on the coal furnace to keep the house warm. And one day, he got a big piece of coal, and he was carrying it very carefully, and his shovel bobbled, and the coal fell off and onto the cement floor and broke in half. And he saw something sticking out of the chunk of coal. And then he got a scraping brush and scraped it off and found a bell in coal. Now, the evolutionists will tell you that this coal is 290 million years old from a time they call the Carboniferous, before even the dinosaurs. Now, what on earth is a bell doing in coal that's supposed to be millions of years before man even evolved? You see, these are human artifacts at the lowest levels of the fossil record, and they tell us it's not millions of years old. And people have been around since the very beginning, and these are human tools from people from a previous world, a world that was judged by God. And their bell and their hammer is left in fossilized material like dinosaur layers and like coal to remind us about God's judgment. Slide. Genesis chapter 4 verse 22 says, Zillah, it's a lady that lived in the early earth, bare Tubal Cain. Now what did Tubal Cain do? He was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. He worked with two metals. What were the two metals, boys and girls? Brass and iron, right? Well, the analysis was done on that bell slide, and that bell was made, the little guy's holding it up there, that bell had, was a bronze bell with an iron clapper. What's a clapper? Put your hands together like a cup like that. And put one finger through. The clapper goes ding, 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 ding in the middle. That was iron, and the, the, the bell was bronze. So an iron clapper and a bronze bell, that's what they found. Maybe that guy was ringing it, you know, trying to call his spirit demon or worship or whatever to save himself in the flood. We don't know. But he was on the wrong side of the ark. He did not listen to God's message through God's prophet Noah, or he could have been saved. But he didn't want to believe God. He didn't want to believe God. And there are lots of people today that don't want to believe God. They don't want to believe the Bible. And someday they will end up judged just like the man that built that bell. Slide. So what is the fossil record? Well, as my friend Ken Ham likes to say, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Basically, the fossil record is a gigantic monument to the Genesis flood. That's what it is. That's what it is. Next slide. So here's our four facts about fossils. Fossils are the result of a catastrophe. Has to be quick. Otherwise, it's going to get scavenged or it's going to rot. Fossils do not show evolution. Oh, no, no, no. We have different kinds of creatures, but we don't have fossils that clearly lead from one kind to another kind. In fact, if anything, the fossils tell us that the world is young. 
Number three, fossils reveal a past world. Fossils tell us there was once a time the earth was very different, where things were bigger and healthier and lived longer than they do today. And number four, fossils remind us about judgment. A time when God destroyed a whole world because of his anger against sin. Next slide. The Bible says this. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Boys and girls, God is going to judge this world again someday. Not with water, but with... Yes? Fire. Very good. I'm impressed you know that. But even if we don't last till that time where God destroys this world with fire, we also will face God's judgment when we leave this world. We have an appointment with God. Now you might say, well, I'm very young still. Well, boys and girls pass from this world too. And we need to be ready to go and meet with God. Are you ready to meet with God? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? If not, you need to talk to your mom or dad or your pastor or somebody about that because that's the most important thing you can do in all the world is to be right with God and to be ready for that time of God's judgment. Okay, next slide. So all we have is a little dash. We don't know how long it is. We know our birth date. We don't know our end date. We have a little dash. We need to use it for God and for his glory. Next slide. Okay, I just want to mention a couple things here before we break for our lunch. Uh, You guys can come up. You can look at the fossils and just 